So the slip model, spring-loaded inverted pendulum. OK, so um, drawing it a little bit more carefully here. I've got a big mass, a leg with a spring. Wow, this I think the reason you guys didn't like my horse is because the tablet's not working right. I think if it hadn't been for that, it would have been, you wouldn't have left, I'm sure. Um, so I'll, I'll, ha I'll worry about the angle of the leg relative to the ground, the mass of the body, the length of the leg, of course, is now a new variable. And uh, it'll have a nominal leg length, so I'll call it L0. There's also now a stiffness parameter, a stiffness of the spring we'll call K. And of course, we've got gravity pointing down. Okay. And we'll also talk about the XY position of the body. Okay, so the state of this guy in general, well, it's the configuration of it is described by the X position of the center mass, the Y position of the center mass, and the angle of the leg. Okay. Now to make this a, a nice tractable model, we're gonna we're gonna make some assumptions, right? Um, we're gonna we're gonna say that the um, the leg and the toe are completely massless. Okay. So you should immediately say, how can that possibly make sense? I mean, maybe that makes sense when you're on the ground. You can just put a point here, and then you still have the mass uh, dynamics like this. But if, when I'm in the air, I'm running, how can that possibly make sense? Okay, that implies that um, we're going to have to assume in the air we're not modeling the swing leg dynamics. We're just going to assume that you have a controller that can instantaneously place the leg wherever you want it to, to be um, for the touchdown angle. So we're going to command touchdown angle. Directly and not model the stances, the swing leg. OK, but the reason to make that assumption is that it also it also now implies a perfectly elastic collision. We used inelastic collisions last time. We're going to take the other extreme this time. Okay, so we have no energy loss to the toe because I'm going to assume the spring is efficient, is perfectly efficient. There's no impact here. Anything as the as the contact is made, any energy is stored in the spring and then restored as the, as you bounce back. Okay. So, so that means actually there are no energy losses in the system. So if you if you're um, so inclined, you might already have a, a problem with this. Um, Presumably, we're going to ask about the stability of this thing. Is it a stable hopper? What are our chances of getting stability if the energy is always conserved? Not so good, right? So dissipation is, oh, sorry. So if you're assuming that there could be an area place here, that should be the next best type of variable, because L is variable, right? Oh, I'm sorry. L is, is in this, too. Thank you very much. I forgot to write L in here. Also in stance, we need L. I just forgot to write it. Good catch. Right, so um, if you have a system that has no energy losses or gains, then you're not going to have a stable system in the full sense. But what we're going to have is, uh, is something, a partial statement of stability. That sort of on the, what, what, what we're going to work towards is given the constraint that energy is conserved, the rest of the states 
It will not be stable in perturbation and energy, but in every other direction it could be stable. Okay, but that you know, um, that actually implies um, can't be stable in the full sense. But what even the dynamicists have been really excited about is that these systems, which are um, piecewise Hamiltonian, right? So the Hamiltonian systems are the energy preserving systems. Um, they can exhibit stability-like properties. Um, some of these hybrid systems that, that a, a, a system that converges, it conserves energy in every hybrid mode, but switches between hybrid modes can exhibit some stability properties beyond what you'd expect from a normal Hamiltonian system. But it can't. It will never restore a perturbation in energy, so it won't ever be really stable. Okay, um, so this is still going to be a hybrid model, right? So. Right, so the, there's a collision that has no losses, an elastic collision. When the foot hits the ground. And then we'll say the robot leaves the ground back into the aerial phase whenever the leg reaches its rest length. So we'll just say the spring ex extends, and when it runs out of run, then the robot will leave the ground. OK, so this gives you a slightly quirky but effective um, model of a hopping robot, which um, you won't be surprised to, to know you could easily put in the software and simulate. Um, so I could probably have tuned the parameters better, but here you go. Here's a running robot that falls into a stable hopping cycle, OK? Stable up to the perturbations in energy. Yeah. Okay, so let's try to understand that model using the return return map machinery. And so uh, it turns out it's stable even if you just leave the con the touchdown angle as a constant. Okay. So. Right stability, but long term dynamics. Okay, so just the controller is doing nothing, it's just saying the same thing every single time, touchdown at this angle. And you saw in the simulation, it popped up and immediately just the leg just went forward as soon as it was in the air, which it could have penetrated the ground. There's all these you know, problems with not analyzing the swing dynamics. But if you make that assumption, then you've got a simple model to work with. Okay. So let's see if we can do our Poincaré map analysis on this. OK, so um, the rimless wheel, we chose the surface of section to be at the instant when the foot hit the ground. Actually, right after the, right, we, we put it right after the collision. Where do we want to put it for this one? You have lots of choices, really. You could put it at the impact. You could put it at a bunch of different places. It turns out that one of them is going to be special in the sense that we're going to be able to um, use less variables to describe it. You could, you could do this in some other state too, but it, it's easy to describe um, the system when you look at it at the apex. Okay, So we'll do an apex to apex map. So at the highest point in its aerial phase. 
Okay, so um, at the apex, we have x, y, theta, x dot, y dot, theta dot. L is a constant in the air. We don't model L in the air, right? So well, I'll just write it L and L dot. Okay, but in general, that looks like it's going to be a hard thing to plot from you know, all those variables to all the next variables. But it turns out things get simpler quick, okay? So first of all, we already said that the angle we've basically taken out of the equation said that we're, we're not modeling the swing dynamics, so those are irrelevant to the dynamics, right? Uh, and these are constant, the leg length is a constant. in the air, and so L dot is zero. So we don't really need to include that in our map. If I, if I tell you at the, I'm at the apex, I already know what L is, so I can, I can infer that from the other variables. Um, what else? So X doesn't really, I don't really care where I am in the world right now. I don't expect to be stable in that variable anyway, so I can ignore that one. Y dot, the apex is defined by the place where Y dot equals zero. So I can get rid of that one too. And suddenly I'm just left with Y and X dot. If I know Y and X dot, I can infer the other, what the other state variables must be. So I can write my, my dynamics as a function of y and x dot and get to the next one. Turns out I can do even one better, because it's all I need. I can infer one of those from the other, because I know that the energy of the system is convert, conserved. So if I know the total energy, I can, the, um, the energy is a function of y and x dot. So if you give me y, I can deduce x dot from y also. Right? If I know the system has some amount of energy in it, you tell me where I am in y, y dot is zero, I can figure out, I can figure out exactly what x dot has to be. Okay? So the result is I can actually write a Poincaré map at the apex, which is just a map from the y height at the nth crossing to the y hat at the next nth crossing. Right, so there was a good question on the discussion forums about do we, what, what dimension do we write down p in? And when you're doing it numerically, you often choose the full n dimensions, and you can take eigenvalues and the like, and, and I, get, well, I, I guess the homework's done, so you know, and then you get a zero eigenvalue out, right? Um, when you're doing analysis, you do your darndest to get it down to the minimal description of it. Of course, you're living on an n minus one dimensional manifold, at least. And it turns out this, this uh, slip model lives on, a, on even a one dimensional manifold. So you might as well write it down with one variable, okay? Does that make sense? If I know the y position at the index, then I know everything about the state of the hopper. And I can simulate forward by, by figuring out from y all the state variables and running my simulation forward. Okay? Now, the simulation has a couple different modes in it. In fact, if you... Um, if you look at the model, there's a, a flight mode and a stance mode in the hybrid system. And there's a transition that goes from flight to stance. Okay, there's a transition at the apex where I'm going to figure out my return map. And then there's this transition from, um, from stance to, uh, to air, which has these takeoff conditions. Okay, so there's, there's two modes and there's transitions back and forth between them. 
it happens that because we were taking the analysis at the at the top, we sp I put the flight in two separate modes. So there's they, there's a flight one and a flight two. This the the flight two is up to the apex, and then there's a transition to the next one just so we can write the the point grade map there at the apex. Okay. All right, so um, so in the flight phase, I mean, the dynamics are easy of this thing, right? In the flight phase, the dynamics are just a point mass moving through the air. Yeah? Can you say that there was not having uh, all these variables? Like, what is that flight phase? The flight phase L is irrelevant, but in the stance phase L will, dom will just give you the dynamics. So, so there's a question of if it's a good model, uh, and I agree that, that that any real system, if there's any, will have mass at the toe, and therefore the, the spring will have non-negligible dynamics in the air. But we've assumed that for the massless toe, the leg is not doing anything in the air. We're just assuming that away. It's I would say it's a questionable model at best, but it seems to describe a lot of data. That's the justification. So, so you said that the top-down angle minimizes constant, right? That, that sounds That's, fine. well, it's... But you also said that you don't have to model the angle at all. Like, that's totally bogus, right? I mean, it's, it's, it irritates me to no end every time I write this model down that we're ignoring the swing dynamics, right? But if you're going to get a one-dimensional return map out of it, that, you know, the reward for being, uh, you know, blasé about the swing dynamics is that I can, I can draw a picture for you, right? That's really the only justification I can give you is that it seems to match data and it's going to let me draw pictures and understand things. But, but for example, to generate that simulation map that you showed, you have to model the... No, I just didn't have that state variable in the air. I set the angle and I'll, I'll write down the dynamics for you. Uh, but I can always infer, at, so um, in the air, I just don't simulate. I just say like, the leg like this constant. I can, I can check when that, that angle hits the ground. Right? I, have, I can write down that function easily. And then during the, the, the stance dynamics, I simulate the dynamics of the leg length. Okay? But then when I, I just lock it for the, you know, so, so L dot is zero during the year. And that's fine. That's a reasonable model. To draw it, I, have to, I had to just write down L dot equals zero, but I actually didn't need that for my model. Okay, so in the flight phase, it's just a ballistic dynamics, right? So, um, I don't have to write that down. It's it's you know, y double dot equals um, negative g. It's a point mass, let's say. Uh, well, so never mind. It's always the negative g. That's silly, uh, right? So that's easy to simulate, easy to solve analytically. It's a linear system. X dot is a constant, right? X double dot is zero. There's no drag. I mean, if, if I'm ignoring the swing leg dynamics, then you can be sure I'm not putting aerodynamic drag in here. Okay. Um, and I can just I can simulate this thing forward just fine, right? In in the flight phase, the dynamics are given, and are linear. So what's more, I can integrate analytically from the apex to the touchdown condition, which is when. y of t equals L0 cos theta touchdown, abbreviate touchdown. So I can find the time where that happens by just solving the, the linear equations and back out the state at the, at the touchdown. Okay. There's no change in velocity at the touchdown, but there is a change of coordinates because in the, um, in the stance phase, I'm going to use a different um, set of variables. I'm going to switch to my state being uh, the, the length of the leg, but I'll, you know, r or theta. I want to just think of it as a polar coordinate, so I call it r for a second. Theta dot. And I'm going to switch to a dynamics like this. So the reset map that I, I build here is really just resetting to these different coordinates.
Okay? And the dynamics here are given, are easy to derive from the Lagrangian too. I just have a potential energy in the spring in addition to the potential energy due to gravity. I can write down my Lagrangian mechanics and write those equations down too. They're on the paper that I've scanned and they're in, they'll be in the notes. Um, but the point is that there's some nonlinear terms in there. There's a sines and cosines in there. So actually figuring out the, the integrating the dynamics across the stance phase to the moment where the takeoff happens, I can't do analytically. So there's nonlinear dynamics. Okay. Unless I'm willing to make a small angle approximation, right? If I assume that I come down at a small angle and sines approximately one and cos that sines approximately theta and cosines approximately one, um, then I can get a linear approximation by making a small angle assumption. Okay, that's something that Hartmut Geyer um, recommended. Hartmut's uh, on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon now. It's his student work, he, he studied the slip model. Thank you. Hartmut Geyer. Okay. And there's even one more annoying thing you have to do because because the linearization is is uh, is wrong, it doesn't conserve energy. So you have to, even though you linearize, then you can get a closed form um, map because it's a linear system. But then you have to do a little correction to make sure the energy is conserved to make it a, a reasonable map. Okay. What I want you to get out of this is that we can do a Poincaré map analysis on uh, more complicated systems. You know, the modes um, might involve changes of coordinates, you know, they might involve um, you know, nonlinear dynamics in some phases, linear dynamics in other phases. Our analysis sometimes involves approximations of those, okay, but the, but the general picture I gave you before of simulating up to a guard, doing a jump equation, simulating beyond, even if you have a limit cycle having to go through multiple transitions, right, these things, all the tools still work, okay, and you can do it for slip, and with some approximations, you can get that. This is the other model where you can get a closed form solution from one surface to another surface. Okay. When you do that, you get sort of a pretty picture out. Okay. Let me try to draw it carefully here. This is y at the nth apex versus y at the n plus 1 apex. Now remember for the Poincaré maps, um, the line of slope 1, or it's a discrete map, so the line of slope 1 is an important line. And this map is sort of, there's some y um, where it doesn't make sense to go below it because there's no aerial phase, right? At some point, I have, to, I have to have a minimum y for my model to make sense. If I start below the leg length, then... then it doesn't make sense, okay? But it's well-defined above that, and I get a picture that looks like this. Okay, so we can ask, you know, the fixed points we know are where these things cross. And you remember that the way you move around on these iterated maps is if I were to start with some initial y, okay, and I go to the next, I, I simulate for one cycle, and I'm going to get a, a larger y 
now. That's going to take me to here. Project back to the map, right? Oops, did I screw up? No, that's right. And then um, that's going to take me to here, and this thing's going to oscillate and come in to be stable. Similarly, if I were to start up here, I'll go here. Right? Do the sort of staircase dynamics. So this one becomes my stable fixed point. On this map, okay? But, uh, and this one is an unstable fixed point. If I start here, Now actually, given a constant energy, um, people might ask, you, you, should, you should think like, what would it mean to go off to infinity sort of on that? That doesn't really make sense. Uh, the model stops making sense up here. Why is that? What's the other sort of limit of this model? The small angle assumption is no good, possibly, but, uh, but there's another reason. Sorry? Yeah. Not, not what I'm looking for, but. So I had, in order to make this plot, I had, to, I had to choose a particular theta touchdown, and I had to choose a particular energy in the system. And if I start going up with y larger and larger, then at some point I don't have meaningful, you know, all my energies in potential are I've exceeded my energy in potential. So there's no energy left for x dot. And somehow it doesn't make sense to go back up past my total energy in the system. The robot stops. Or even before that, the robot will have so little horizontal velocity that it won't, that it'll come in and it won't make it over the hump, it'll just fall down, uh, which the model does do in simulation. Um, okay. All right, so this is, this is with a certain set of parameters that, you know, the energy was in a normalized uh, units and everything like that, but this is a, you know, a characteristic. So, so this complicated hopping system still has this stable fixed point here, which of course is a function of the parameters you pick. But there is a stable hopping solution that you can actually draw and understand with all these Poincaré tools, given a few assumptions. Okay. Now, just to just to say it one more time, um, I put stable in quotes. It won't reject perturbations in energy. Right, so in the full coordinates, you'd look, it would look like having multiple eigenvalues of zero. And a perturbation along the energy would have an eigenvalue of one, I guess. But uh, it's, it's going to be, it's never going to reject perturbations in energy. Okay, so the initial motivation of that model was to understand the vertical dynamics of the center of mass. Okay, but the biologists really love this. They could make, you could predict, and it would work for crabs running sideways, and it worked for cockroaches, and all these crazy things. So they started looking for it in other places, right? And, and um, the lab that studied cockroaches, Bob Full's lab, found that even the horizontal dynamics, the lateral dynamics of the cockroach, could roughly be described with these models. Okay? But you might ask, how the heck do you measure the dynamics of a lateral perturbation on a cockroach, okay? So Bob Full's lab is awesome. They have, you know, they, so one of the reasons, that, you know, they had to make a ground, uh, uh, basically a force plate to measure the ground reaction forces for a cockroach. That sounds like a hard instrumentation problem. The way they solved it is they actually, they found a way to put jello down with a diffraction grating on the top and the bottom so that when the cockroach pushed the jello, it would bend the light 
and they had a force sensor based on making the cockroaches run on jello. <laughs> and apparently orange jello was good because they ate that a little bit slower, but they still ate it. So it was sort of annoying <laughs> that they would eat their force sensor. Okay, but, um, but that's not the best of their experiments. Um, my favorite by far was when they were actually trying to figure out how do you perturb the cockroach, right? So how do you, how do you put a perturbation, to the, a lateral perturbation to the cockroach? These guys are moving pretty fast. So you'd like the perturbation to be a subset of the time of the stance dynamics for it to be meaningful. You'd like it to be an impulse, right? So, so they were trying to tie strings and you know, you know, all these things. It was really, really hard, okay? The thing they came up with was just, in the end, was just, just awesome. So um, let me show you the video first, okay? So that's a, that's a cockroach. And on top of the cockroach, you might wonder what that is. You get a little hint there. So, so don't be distracted by the ball here. That was actually an accident that it bounced back. This is a cannon. That they, so the nice thing about cockroaches is they have exoskeletons, and you can bolt things to them. Okay. <laughs> so let me play that again. So this is a a cockroach with a cannon strapped to his back. <laughs> and as he's running, the cannon explodes right about here. It happens, in, it happens in this particular video, the ball came back and he got a second perturbation, but that wasn't really the point. And the great thing was that um, they, were, they, they were able to measure the kinematics of this guy, and although it took him a few steps to correct his orientation, his horizontal velocity was corrected within a single stride, and it matched they're, they're, what they were looking for was this lateral leg spring dynamics, so a, a, swing, a, a spring mass model in the horizontal. Okay? So they argued with that, not only that, it was, uh, that the spring mass model generalized to horizontal, but actually that it had to be a physical spring in the leg because it was too fast for neural conduction in the cockroach. Now the great thing is, I know Devin, who, who, who did this experiment in Bob Full's lab, he gave me the, the video, and... Uh, um, he, he said sort of on the side, you know, I, I was asking him about what it was like to do that experiment. He said, first of all, it was, ha it was crazy getting permission to do it, right? You know, that was a lot of work, right? So even though you can do anything you want to an invertebrate, apparently, but, uh, but still having gunpowder in the lab is not good. Um, but uh, he just, on the side, he mentioned one day, he said, um, he said it's surprising how little gunpowder you need, right? And I thought to myself later that there must have been intermediate experiments. <laughs> right? Where, where it's just like, boom, you know, there's, you know, where'd he go, you know? So, I just love, I love that kind of science. Okay. Um, all right, so it turns out that the spring, um, the spring loaded inverted pendulum model has had uses here. It's also been generalized now. It, people used to think of, like I said, walking as vaulting over a stiff leg. Nowadays, people think of, think about the role of compliance even in walking. That's been then cleared that, that that's important also in walking. Your center mass still goes up, but your leg does bend a little bit in walking, and that's an important part of the dynamics. And there's been nice work that Hartmut went on to, to, to talk about um, um, these models here, which could produce both walking and running by modeling now the swing leg dynamics when appropriate, okay? Having two legs, basically two spring mass models, and this model with different initial energies can, can give you both walking and running, okay? And what's more, he argued that the ground reaction forces produced by the model were, were somewhat reasonable compared to, to biology. Okay, so, um, so let's do a little bit more. So, that, so this was all given, um, given a constant command, right? 